Namaste and welcome. The Radha Krishnan Memorial Lecture is the flagship event of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. It is an annual event named after our founder, Dr. Sarvapali Radha Krishnan. And when the Institute celebrated its Silver Jubilee in 1991, the first Radha Krishnan Memorial Lecture was instituted in his name and memory. And the speaker was a renowned philosopher, D.P. Chattopadhyay, who has written extensively on Lokayat. Subsequently, we've had leading educationists, jurists, philosophers, politicians, and uh, scientists who have given these lectures. The 2019 lecture was delivered by His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, a Nobel laureate and a philosopher, as well as spiritual leader of great international renown. The event held in Delhi was attended by more than 3,000 people live and also disseminated on various media platforms afterwards. Previous lectures have been given by notables such as uh, Dr. Bibek Debroy, uh, Vice President Hamid Ansari, scientists such as Jayant Narlikar, the Speaker of the Lok Sabha, Dr. Meera Kumar, and a variety of other distinguished people such as Simon Blackburn, an educationist, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice R.S. Pathak, Justice Leela Seth, uh, U.R. Anantamurti, who was a Gnanpeet Award winner, and uh, many such very, very distinguished speakers. This year's lecture, that is the 2020 lecture, had to be modified a little bit because of COVID. It could not be a live event, so instead it is going to be a conversation. And I'm deeply honored and privileged and gratified to introduce our speaker. He's none other than Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev. Sadhguru has a following of more than 10 million worldwide. There are more than 300 centers of Isha Yoga all over the world. He's a thought leader, a best-selling author. In fact, his book, Inner Engineering, was in the New York Times bestseller list. His new book on karma is also uh, has royalties, advanced royalties, which would put the top authors of the world into shade. A visionary, a mystic, a thought leader who has transformed the lives of many. Sadhguru was also awarded the second highest civilian honor in India, by the government of India, Padma Vibhushan. We were fortunate to go to his beautiful ashram in the Velyangiri foothills in south of India, near uh, Coimbatore, in fact, in Tamil Nadu. And this is called the Pongal Dialogue for a Conscious Planet because it was recorded on the 13th of January, which is Pongal or Lori in the north and just on the eve of Sankranti, the Harvest Festival. And Sadhguru is passionate about transforming our lives, inner engineering as he calls it. And uh, we were fortunate enough to experience some of the Kriyas that are taught in this wonderful ashram. It also has the tallest bust in the world as per the Guinness Book of World Records, which was inaugurated by Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2017 or 16, I think. And uh, thousands come to the ashram every day. It has other unique features. There is the Linga Bhairavi, the uh, charged uh, Dhyana Lingam, a place where you can meditate in a large dome. It has the Surya Kund as well as the Chandra Kund and uh, a variety of other programs are run on a continuous basis in the ashram. We were fortunate to visit and record this dialogue, which is a slightly different format than the normal lecture format. We hope you enjoy it. It is going to be in three parts and uh, uh, we have uh, made it into an Upanishadic format, I should call it. And uh, we hope that this dialogue touches you as it touched us who were privileged to take part in it. Thank you very much and welcome to the Radha Krishnan Memorial event, I should call it 2020. Makrand, Namaskaram and welcome to Isha Yoga Center. Wonderful to have you here. Namaskaram, Sadhguruji. I would like to begin with an expression of triple gratitude from the IIAS, that is Indian Institute of Advanced Study extended family, but also on behalf of all seekers 
to you, to the Guru Parampara, to all your uh, colleagues and volunteers here for this opportunity. I'm deeply grateful and we want to do this with a Shubhicha or Bhadra Icha to make the planet more conscious as you've been trying to do through all your work. So my deepest gratitude. I also want to bring the greetings of the great Himalayan masters since we are in Shimla and in the morning we see those beautiful mountains mm -hmm. and also from Tiruvannamalai because I have been going there since the age of 16 to Ramana Maharishi and later to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. And as a very small token of my gratitude, if you don't mind, I want to present this book to you, which uh, oh. on Swami Vivekananda. Yesterday was his birthday, as you know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know when is my birthday most of the time, so <laughs> I'm not good at these things. <laughs> as observed by the rest, as observed by the rest. I think it's in September, I'll give you a clue. <laughs> yours. But uh, so Sadhguru, I want to begin with a quotation of yours which struck me from uh, Inner Engineering. And you say, there is magic everywhere if you learn how to live it. Life is nothing short of a daily miracle. Now, for most of us who can't remember having had a single day free of anxiety or some kind of distress, this statement seems like somewhat of an exaggeration. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, let me uh, kind of forewarn you, you are uh, talking to a, somebody who is just little above illiteracy, okay? You are a <laughs> highly educated person uh, who lives in the university. So we need to understand this. Stress, distress, struggles or the sphere of one's psychological space. Unfortunately, because everybody has taken to the European model, we think human thought is something tremendous, unfortunately. This kind of perception or this kind of conclusion has entered human societies because certain societies were living under a terrible religious dogmatic rule, theocratic rules. So when they broke out of that, so essentially religion was telling you, you cannot think the way you want. You can only think the way my book says. So when some people broke out and started thinking the way a human being could think, they thought they liberated. In fact, they went out to use the absurd… Uh, <laughs> the absurdity of calling it the age of enlightenment. Age of thinking freely is not enlightenment. It is just that from slavery, you came into your prison. As a slave, you were ruled by somebody, some other force, but you could move around. But now from there you entered a prison and you think you're enlightened, because your only uh, freedom is that somebody is not telling you how to think. But what you need to understand is the way you think is completely curtailed by what you've been exposed to whether it is religion or society or education or general exposure to life. So your way of thinking is essentially a consequence of the data that you have gathered by the exposure, the impressions that you have had. So thought has never been considered a significant thing in this culture. In the yogic culture, we don't give any significance to your thought. It doesn't matter how high you think it is, how low you think it is, we don't acknowledge it of any significance except for survival processes. To survive in the world, you must have clarity of thought. But to know, you cannot have clarity of thought because thought can never be clear. Because thought is a, uh, a permutation, combination, expression of the limited data that you have. So in thought, if you arrived at enlightenment, what it means is, there was a million piece jigsaw here, you picked up three pieces, you made it like this and say, oh, it looks like a crow, it is a crow, it is a crow. Very unfortunate because it's a million piece jigsaw. You saw only three pieces, you found only three pieces, with that you're drawing a conclusion. 
So when you do this, suffering is inevitable, it must happen. You know, this is why we say satyam eva jayate, only truth works in the end. Because any f false conclusions you come into will seem to work at a certain point of life, at a certain situation, then the same thing will torture you. This is the evolutionary uh, history of human intellect. Because we're misunderstanding human intellect as the be-all of life. Intellect is... A w if I ask you this question, would you like your intellect to be sharp or blunt? Obviously, you want it sharp. I'm sure every one of the school children will say, I be wanted sharp. That means it's a cutting instrument. To dissect you, I can use a knife. But after dissection, if I want to sew you up, then also you use a knife, I will leave you in tatters, isn't it? That's all intellect is doing. So obviously you must be tormented. If an intellectual person is not tormented, I am surprised. <laughs> Why are they not tormented? They must be tormented because that is the way of the intellect. There's nothing wrong with it, it's very much in line. So there are other dimensions of human intelligence. Right now, uh, I, I'm not trying to go, uh, you know, like in terms of, uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, trying to say this versus that. These are different aspects. We are just stuck on one thing. So for example, an academic life means it's become, our education means unfortunately, has become purely intellectual. Because here also, if we are in the school, here also the government has prescribed a certain system of education, which is largely intellectual in nature. We have softened the whole atmosphere so that the intellectual is there, but the other dimensions of intellect, they have intelligence also they have to use. From the simplest thing, an uneven floor, Every very logically correct person comes, why this uneven floor, you know, I twisted my ankle. You twisted your ankle, not because the floor is uneven, because you're unconscious. Hello? Because you want to walk on this planet without being conscious, so you will twist your ankle. So everywhere there is constantly, every time some new construction comes up, the engineers will come and say, Sadhguru, let's do a concrete flooring, Sadhguru. Please don't want this, Sadhguru, it's so difficult to clean. I said, both the cleaner and the walker must walk consciously and do his job consciously, it's very, very important. And we also know neurologically, it makes you much more vibrant and alive when you walk on uneven floors rather than flat surfaces. They are connecting Alzheimer's at the age of eighty to constantly walking on flat floors today, okay? So it is not that we do not know these things, it's just that Everything has to be found out piece by piece, piece by piece, piece by piece. So this academic approach in the world essentially come from European cultures where intellect is supreme. Thought, human thought is the highest thing. But human thought, as I repeatedly said, is only a consequence of the limited data that we have. So when I say daily miracle, if you pay attention to life around you, Everything is miraculous, everything is miraculous. From the same soil, this people tree has come up. From the same soil, a jasmine wine is coming up. From the same soil, a mango tree is coming up. Do they all look same, taste same, smell same? How come? Then you will say, oh, the genetics of the seed, this, 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 whatever. Doesn't matter, even that you know, all came from a single-celled amoeba and it's all happened. It's a continuous miracle. And every human being, well, your parents didn't give you this many million cells, like the virus is coming in millions, all right? <laughs> it's more generous than your parents. Your parents, each one gave only one cell. Look at you, how you become. Is this not a miracle? If you paid attention. Now, the fundamental problem is this. We are thinking our memory is superior to our attention. That is the fundamental mistake they have made and they must suffer. It's wonderful, uh, Sadhguru. There is, there was an architect in Austria who said nature abhors the straight line. So he made, you know, his principle in his architectural creations that nothing will be straight. So the walls were also curvaceous. And there's a house there in Austria. But when you build a building, if you bend it, you will spend it. <laughs> because an architect doesn't have to spend money. He can do this, this, this. When you try to build, the budgets will multiply. <laughs> yes, even the floor is uneven, but it makes you very conscious. 
So coming to, you know, uh, consciousness and the planetary consciousness, you know, COVID, uh, many people think, Sadhguru, was an opportunity for the human race, at least, to introspect, to cleanse itself, to prepare for a better future. Do you think that we actually took advantage of it or we just suffered and became more miserable? Isn't it unfortunate? Uh, a virus which is not even a full-fledged life, it's only a half a life. Without a host, it cannot exist, all right? A half a life has to be your guru to become conscious. <laughs> how... <laughs> how unfortunate it is and how insulting is it for the guru <laughs> But uh, yes, we can always see there is a way of making positives out of everything. Because what life throws at us is not always our choice. What we make out of it is entirely our choice. So in that context, yes. But is it a good thing that the virus came? This is like saying it's a good thing World War II happened because after that we built all our cities new. You ask the dead people, is it a, was it a good thing? You ask the people who lost their dear ones, is it a good thing? I mean, it's a very cruel thing to say, I'm saying. Nearly two million people have died. In many countries, even today in the United States, four thousand people per day are dying. You go and tell those people who lost their child, who lost their mother, who lost his wife or husband, you go and tell them it's actually… virus is actually a good thing, we are all becoming conscious. What is it? Inhuman, I would say. So, about we making the best of whatever comes our way, that is always… it must be so. If wealth comes, you must make it something wonderful out of it. If poverty comes, you must make it something wonderful out of it. Health comes, making something wonderful out of it. But that's not how they are. See, why are they saying virus is a good lesson? Because when they were healthy, when everything was well, they were wasting themselves. Now, because they're restricted to their houses, everything. Tomorrow, if somebody declares virus is gone, they will all be the same. Don't go by these philosophers, this is called smashan vairagya <laughs> You know what that is? I know, I know. When somebody close to you dies, suddenly everybody says, what is there, this four days life, what is there? There's… what is the point of desiring this, that? Before the fires are out, again everything is burning. So this Mashan Vairagya is not going to help if you're genuinely going to use it for your well-being, it's fine, but you cannot use a specific situation for your well-being. You have to be that oriented in that direction. If virus has oriented you that way, I bow down to the vi virus. I bow down to the virus and to you. It's an accidental and compulsory orientation. If it works for some, making them introspective, well and good. But you know, it uh, sort of… Uh, connects with another deep issue, what you just mentioned. So many people died in an untimely way. And uh, I found your book, Death, you know, the insights. So that was timely. I published it in February 2020. Amazing, with that black cover. And, no uh, timing, you tell me. Everything. <laughs> uh, as long as they didn't say you made it happen, that, that's good. That they will say. There is a section of media will say he only caused the virus because he published the death book and unleashed death on the planet. There is a section of media who will be doing that, that's okay <laughs> But Sadhguru, you were talking about these almost two million who died and uh, some of these deaths were untimely. Now, uh, what about these people who just were not ready to die and perhaps, you know, their relatives and loved ones who were not ready to let them go? Is there something at a, you know, conscious planet level that, uh, you know, all of us who've managed to escape, uh, is there anything we can do or is there anything uh, that you have to say, you know, because the book has a lot, I would recommend it, but it has a lot of stuff in it. So. Well, those who were taken from us in an untimely way. See, if uh, a person has lived well, always it's untimely, even if you die at hundred. There was a sage in Karnataka, last year he passed away before the virus came, all right? He was a hundred and eleven years of age. His entire life from the age of fourteen or fifteen, he has been in service, he built many schools and his life is serving people, all right, in his own way. When he died at one-one-one, 
all the media, suddenly he died. I said, what one, 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 how can somebody die suddenly? At one, 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 you, you've been dying for hundred and one, eleven years, all right. So if you're fifty years of age, you've been dying for fifty years. So death is never sudden existentially. Psychologically, socially, it may be sudden. Depending on the level of activity and level of involvement and engagement that somebody has, Suppose you are eng engaged with thousands of people. If you die today, everybody will think, oh no, he should have lived for some more time. Ask them to sp uh, specify how much time I should have lived or somebody else should have lived. They'll say at least another fifty years. The more emotional ones here, if you bring my name and say, how long should Sadhguru live? Forever. Sadhguru live sh should live forever. forever. So they want to punish me, <laughs> not one lifetime, they want to give me multiple lifetimes like some really bad psychotic killers, somebody gets that kind of thing, you know, ten lifetimes of imprisonment. They want to give me something like that out of their love <laughs> So, <laughs> so it is never timely or untimely when it comes to death. It's unfortunate somebody who… whose body could have lasted another thirty, forty, fifty years died. It is unfortunate because whatever little purposes they have in their life. They may not have some great purpose, but that little purpose is a big purpose in their life, okay? They want to build a house, they want to raise their children. This may look like, oh, what about it? Even a… you know, an insect does, a bird does, what about that? But it's a great purpose because they've invested their entire life into that. So something becomes little or great, not because of what it is, because of the level of involvement a given person has with it. In that sense, it is untimely, that before he could fulfill what he wants to do in his life. Anyway, I will die that way without fulfilling what I have to do, because w what I want to do is like that. But for all of them, they could have reasonably fulfilled, at least if not completely, what they wished to do in their life, so they died before that. In that context, it is untimely, socially untimely, family-wise untimely, maybe physiologically also untimely, existentially nothing is untimely. See, yesterday we did a little bit of the Isha Kriya and then at the end you have this beautiful chant from Shankaracharya where you say, Punarapi Jananam, Punarapi Maranam and then you say, Iha Sansare Bahudustare, Kripaya Pare, Pahi Murare. Now, that's the point that you're not ready, you just go and then you have to come back. That same small purpose may drag you back. So, isn't this the time to figure out who Now you're are? leaving the university <laughs> time to leave the university. <laughs> no, no, this question I'm saying. Well, I mean, I think my point was that uh, the presence of death should definitely trigger a very serious questioning as to our purpose, why we're here. See, uh, people always think, unfortunately, the religious cultures everywhere in the world have brought about this misunderstanding that if you think about God, you will become spiritual. No, most of the time if you think about God, you become a bloody idiot <laughs> because now you think God is a fair price shop or a miracle maker, you say, without studying for the examination, they want to pass the examination, dear God, help me out, write for me. But he says, no, this chemistry I have not studied <laughs> So, whatever. So, I am saying thinking about God always makes you unrealistic. Because first of all, thinking about God, there is a certain lack of integrity in it. Because you have already made a conclusion about something that you know nothing about. It must be an inquiry, it must be a quest. It must be a seeking. Instead of that, you have a conclusion. Conclusion means in some way it is death. The conclusion for this life is death, isn't it? So if every time I conclude, something within me dies in a small way, if I make ten thousand conclusions, this is why from a child who was like this and jumping around, <laughs> so become like this, why? ten thousand conclusions in their head. So unfortunately, these conclusions are being interpreted as knowledge. So we have to make a distinction 
between what is knowledge which can be accumulated over a period of time and what is knowing. Yes. So this previous question also about miracle, if you pay attention to this tree, every fresh leaf mm. is a miracle. But now, because people have so much knowledge about this, you know, they have studied in the botany class what all this tree is, ah, they don't pay any attention to the tree. Ah, this tree, okay, they know the name. As a rule, I made sure that I don't learn the names of any trees, plants and flowers. They ask me, Sadhguru, what is this flower? I don't know what it is, this is what it looks like, this is what it smells like, this much I know, but I don't want to give it a name. This is a stupid human need that we have to call each other, so you call yourself one name, I call myself another name. This is a human society. The flowers never said we need a name. The birds never said we need a name. Well, we want to identify, so we give it a name, that's understandable. Because you need to... You, can, you cannot say one, two, three, four, uh, A, one, two, three, four, whatever, B, one, two, three, four, it'll become, uh, you know, a lack of uh, aesthetic in it. So we call it, uh, this is Malli, this is uh, Jaji, this is this, that, is fine. But I see that slowly the names are becoming, the mind is full of dictionary, all the words in the dictionary. And if you mix all the words in the dictionary, somebody thinks it's literature. No, literature needs heart, all right? So life needs heart. If you looked at it, if you paid attention to every new leaf coming or old leaf falling, you will see there is miracle and magic in it. Just you throw filth, tomorrow you bring some extra filth and put it at the roots of this uh, plant, you will see within seven, eight days, it'll be bursting with flower, with fragrance. Is it not a miracle? How come you can't see it? Oh, I know, I know all this, this happens, this chemistry happens. You don't know nothing, mm. you understand? You have understood, you kind of maybe observed a few processes, but you do not know how it happens. That's why when you do not understand how something happens, it's a miracle, isn't it? This does not mean there is no basis to it. There is another kind of process to that also. But right now it is not under your perception, so it's a miracle for you. So would you say similarly death is something we don't understand and that's why we are afraid of it so much? Well, do you understand light? What kind of light? Live death. Do you understand li life? Life. Uh, we have to try hard, we can't take it for granted because life surprises No, I'm us. asking you a simple question. Yes, I do, to an extent. You understand life? To an extent. Not uh, life in the university, life no, in this and that, no. not like that, life. No. Yes, I think a bit I do. I if do. you really grasp what is life, then death is an obvious part of that. Okay, okay. Yeah. But uh, no, Many of us that, don't, see, yeah. when, you, when you utter the word life with mm. most people, you have to search what are they talking about? They could be talking about their home, they could be talking about their family, they could be talking about their relationships, their career, their wealth, their whatever else they meet. Maybe it's their car, maybe it's their uh, dog. They're talking about something, you have to search what are they talking about. The problem is this, they have mixed up what is life and what are its accessories. Suppose, a car is parked here and you start thinking the spare wheel is the car. What will you do? You will roll it and run, thinking brrrr, you can go, it's okay if you were a... F if you were a five-year-old child, it's all right. You just enjoying the spare wheel as a car. But if you're a full-grown man and if you do it, we know what's the problem, right? <laughs> right now, that is what is happening. People are misunderstanding accessories that you add. Why do you add clothing to you? To enhance yourself. Why do you add education to yourself? To enhance yourself. Why do you add family to yourself? To enhance yourself. In some way, to enhance your experience, you're adding frills and frills. Now, so much frill, no skirt. <laughs> That's yeah, what has happened. Friend, you said that the basic urge of life is to be boundless. Is it not? Wherever you are, you want to be something more. 
If something more, something more, endlessly it's something more, what does it mean? But isn't death a boundary? See, one of my deep issues was that when I talked about untimely deaths, see, people do some sadhana, they want to reach the spiritual threshold, whatever it is, you know, and then sometimes you're worried that next time I again start in the nursery of life. Same semester. Same semester, <laughs> stuck forever like JNU students, you see. <laughs> I had that reflex on the professors. I know, I know. Students they, are not moving to the next class. They love, they love us so much, they just want to remain with us. But we call it free progress, Sadhguru. Graduate as you please, when you like, at your own pace. That is fine, yeah. as long as I'm not paying for it. That's the whole point. That the is state, the whole point. State pays for it. They, Go on no, go state on. doesn't pay. Where the state have money? We pay. We're paying for it. I agree. I agree. So that is the only problem. Otherwise, somebody wants to study in the same first standard for uh, thirty years or fifty years. What is my problem? <laughs> twenty-six years you run twenty-six alphabets. What is my issue? I have no issue. But you're spending my money on it. That's my issue. True. <laughs> True. Absolutely. Yeah, but apart from the morbidity, I mean, even the Upanishad, even the Gita says, no effort you take on the path will be lost. So they even tell you, you may have a favorable... That means this year's grades will go to the next year. Carry over, <laughs> transfer <laughs> credits, but... Anyway, about whether uh, spiritual credits will go to the next life. See... Uh, Should take this hand. If you've seen only the tips of my fingers like this, you would think Sadhguru is five, five manifestations he has. But if you come up my fingers here, you will think I'm just one. So right now, this whole thing about this many lifetimes, this, that, is only because of your uh, entanglement with your own physical self. What is your physical self? Well, uh, we've already gone into this, that your parents gave you only one cell. Rest is all the food that you've eaten, which is multiplied, all right? So it's just the soil that you walk upon. So it's not you, really. Including those two cells is not you, it's your parents. But still, are you not distinctly existing beyond your parents? Are you distinctly reality? Beyond your parentage, beyond your culture, beyond your education, are you existing for sure? Yes. So, you are mistaking the platform for the being. So, if I change my platform, will it go away? Yes, certain things connected with the platform will go. Now, even if you change from, <laughs> you know, if you change your uh, cell phone uh, service mm. from Airtel to Reliance or Reliance to something else, if you change, they're willing to give you the same number. number. Same. See, things have changed. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you only change the platform. Because of your excessive entanglement with your physical self, you are wondering another life. There's no another life, there's just life. Mm -hmm. Like you wear out footwear, you wear out the bodies. So, if you buy a pair of footwear, if it… depending upon how much you walk, let's say it lasts for six months or one year, well, if you have different types of footwear, let's say for trekking you have one kind of boots, for playing you have another kind of shoes, for walking you have another kind of sandals, if you have like this, if I… if you buy one pair of each, maybe it'll last for two years or three years. So, how quickly I wear out my footwear depends on how I use it, right? In what sense I use this body and this psychological makeup. Both are accumulated. Accumulated means it is yours for now, but cannot ever be you. Mm -hmm. So what is you, will it change? No. no. What is yours, will it change? Of course. Unless there is such a program in JNU, they can again come back to the same program. <laughs> You're bringing us back to JNU, not me. <laughs> yeah, but that's like, it's wonderful because uh, even in the Yoga Sutras, that's what they say, 
that there is the witness and then there are the vrittis. So if you are nothing but the life, then and if you're not the vrittis, the vrittis will change. But that is limitless, that goes on. But for most of us, the transition, the, we have to re-identify. No, no, no. Let me correct that a little bit. <clears throat> because you're bringing in all these uh, terminologies. See, that which is limitless has no characteristic of its own. I always use this soap bubble analogy. You mm -hmm. blow a soap bubble, you blow one bubble, I blow one bubble. Yours is this big, a mine is this big. I'll say, see, this is my bubble. It's bigger than yours. But both went poop. Then I don't say this is my air, that's your air. In that context, this is a living cosmos. Each one of us captures something. See, it doesn't matter how big a body you gathered, this is how much earth you gathered. Or how much impressions you gathered, social stuff you gathered. I'm… I'm putting education, science, everything as social stuff. You gathered impressions, variety of impressions. Or you gathered more life. How much life you gather within you will determine how significant your life becomes. Once again, significance not in terms of society or the world uh, or what you achieve in the world, no. If you sit here, if you have gathered enough life within you, just sitting here is so significant, it is not necessary that you have to do something. Or in other words, it releases you from the compulsiveness of action. That is what is most needed. But everybody is trying to fill themselves with more muscles, more uh, brawn and brain and whatever, this will only entangle them. See, if I… if I build, let's say, three times the muscle that I have, this muscle is enough for me to carry out my kind of work. Very effectively, I can do what I want to do. But now tomorrow, I suddenly got a dream that I want to be a sumo wrestler. So I put on three times or four times of this. Now my entanglement with food and other things, you know, uh, in, uh, the whole process of the body increases phenomenally, all right? So similarly, right now I have very little in my head. That's why I wear a turban just to make it look impressive enough, okay <laughs> So, this is enough for me to navigate through the world because my business with the world and society is of a certain kind. My impact in the world is not from my knowledge. My impact in the world is simply by the significance of my presence. So this presence, well, I can use it to do something in the world also, but the most important thing is there is no compulsive action anymore because if you sit here, it is wonderful just to be sitting here. There is no need that I must do something. So this is the fundamental. How much life have you gathered? Now we were talking about soap bubbles. Let us think of soap bubbles as a bubble with five layers of soap. Physical body, mental body, you know these things, energetic body and etheric body. So till the energy body, you dropped everything. Then, still there is a very subtle bubble. That bubble still is an individual, but not capable of social function or, you know, phenomenal function in the world. But if you have energetic body, you're still functional, but not present as people experience you through their five senses. If you have a mental body, then people can feel you. If you have a physical body, of course, it's very obvious. It's opaque. The importance of physical body is it's opaque. Yes, that is why all this. If you are transparent, why do you need these clothes? Why do you need this, that, nothing? All right? Because it's opaque, that means it stops light. Because you need to understand this, your sense organs are made like this. For example, your visual perception is made like this. You only see that which stops light. You don't see anything which allows light to pass through. See, right now, the air here is more vital for your life than me, all right? But you don't see it, unless you live in Delhi, of course <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> then we see smog, not air, not the… No, you see the air <laughs> Here we can't see the air, it's a, ble it's a blessing, we can't see the air. So this is the most significant thing, one minute if this is withdrawn, question of life and death, but we can't see it. Because we can't see it, mostly we've forgotten that it's there. Similarly with life, because you cannot see it, you mostly you've forgotten that this is life. Then came the body, then came the mind, then came the people, then came the things, but no, things and people and this and that, everything is important, life is not important. Let's say you have all the wealth in the world, you have the best relationships in the world, you have the best uh, whatever titles and fame and name and everything, we'll just take the life out of you. What? <laughs> what will you do with that, I'm asking <laughs> So I'm saying we're missing the fundamental and going on building castles in the air. So you're asking, will the same castle follow me? No. But the life force will attach? It… see, when you talk about the limitless living cosmos, there is no specific characteristic as you and me think about good, bad, this is nice, not nice, nothing like that, it's simply a certain living force which is intelligent, which is on, intelligent, not intellectual, okay? Let me make that distinction very clear. Because intelligence means today we think it's intellectual. No, you are essentially making the mistake of believing that memory is more important than attention. Human attention is what opens doors. Human memory recycles. Recycling, for recycling you need some substance, isn't it? So, whether you can carry your this year's uh, merits to the next, there is no such thing. Mm. It's a continuum. It is just that we are changing our footwear. Rest is continuing. But the subtlest part of the bubble also can be broken. Mm. So when that happens, you call it nirvan. Mm. See, people are not understanding the negative connotation of that. Nirvan means you don't exist anymore. The Hindu way of life expressed it in more positive ways. That is, we said muksha, moksha, mukti. Let's say mukti means what? You became free. Free from what? From life and death. That means what? You don't exist. But we use positive words. The yogic culture used both. Mukti, moksha also, kaivalya also, nirvana also, or nirvikalpa or shunya, all these words they used, wherever it is necessary, whichever way, depending upon a particular person, with some we used uh, positive words, with some we used negative words. Why this strategy is, the moment you say something positive, people will start hallucinating. Suppose I say you will attain moksha and you will be free. Well, how will he imagine what is freedom? like a bird in the sky, maybe I will be flying up there like this and doing something. Whatever is his idea of freedom will magnify itself. Everybody has their own silly ideas of freedom, all right? Freedom means the only way to be free is to be free from the very existence. Because your existence is the burden that you're suffering, isn't it? There are some uh, joys and pleasures attached to it, so it is great. But if you shave off those things, everybody will say, I want to die, isn't it? If you take away every source of joy and pleasure that they have in their life, the first thing that comes to anybody's mind is, should I live at all? Because that's all it is. It is those few sweetmeats which are <laughs> keeping them going <laughs> So, to go beyond both of those things, and by choice, you can be what you want to be in this given moment. Once you come there, then undoing the whole process becomes a living possibility.